Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Cross Community once again. If you haven't been here over the last few weeks, I do want to say this. Um, that's the last time you have to watch that bumper where you have to stare at a snake, all right? So we've been in this series called The Snake in the Garden where we've been looking at spiritual warfare and what that looks like in our lives in particular. How is the church supposed to respond? Um, in, in week one, we said we have an enemy, but that enemy is not flesh and blood. Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, would want us to know, like, your neighbor is not your enemy. Your neighbor is not the problem. Your spouse isn't your problem. Your coworker isn't the problem, right? Our battle is not flesh and blood. Our war isn't against other people in our lives. As a matter of fact, those people they may very well be uh, our mission. Like, God may have placed us in uh, our particular family with that particular person. We all have one of them, right? You may have been placed in your job uh, with that coworker or in your neighbor, whatever it might be. It may be that that person especially isn't our enemy, but it may be that they're actually our mission, that you have been sent there to bring light into the midst of darkness on their behalf. And so we don't fight a battle of flesh and blood, uh, but we stu still do have to fight a battle. And so week one, we saw in Ephesians, Paul saying, armor up, bless, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, belt of truth, feet shod with the readiness of the gospel, because there is a battle to be fought, right? And then the, the last couple of weeks, we, we looked at the tactics of our enemy. Satan is our deceiver. Uh, above all else, the enemy would wish to lead you away from the way, the truth, and the life, following the way of Jesus Christ and ultimately to begin to walk a path of destruction, deceiving you from what is true. And then last week, our enemy is the accuser. That should you happen to be a believer in Jesus Christ, you've heard the gospel, you responded in faith, what the enemy would wish to do is to make you ineffective. And so to tell you that, listen, you are not a child of God, you're not a, a, a chosen people, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, but instead, um, you are your sin. You're your past, you're your brokenness, you're your weakness. And so you just sit back, don't ever get engaged in the battle, don't worry about spiritual warfare. You just sit tight and don't let, uh, don't let yourself get too involved with things because you're somehow not called of God like everyone else would be. So we know those two things are lies. And this week what I want to encourage you to do is to get into the battle. To begin to wage spiritual warfare on your own. Like, armor is not something you wear for fun, right? It's not a fashion statement. It's not particularly enjoyable to walk around in. But the scripture would say, put on the armor of God. And that's because it's expected that we would go to battle. Now, if you want to go ahead and jump there in your Bible, we're going to wind up in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 today. Uh, but I want to give you some background for the book. You've kind of got the final therefore of... Peter's letter, all right? So this is kind of his concluding parting thoughts, but I want to open with you so that you know who Peter was writing to and ultimately kind of the theme of the book of First Peter. So here's where he begins as he, as he opens his letter. Here's, here's who he's writing to. It says, to those who reside as aliens or as strangers, as foreigners, to those who reside as foreigners scattered through Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus, be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. So he's saying to all of you believers who are out there, wherever you may find yourself at this point, whether you're in Pontus or Galatia or Cappadocia, to those of you who are foreigners, which means where you are living is not actually your home. You're a stranger to this place. Your home is somewhere else. Your citizenship is in another place. And you just happen to be where you are. And in particular, Peter's writing to a people that they are there for a specific purpose. If you know what happened, uh, the church in Acts, uh, the, the early church, Peter preaches the gospel on Pentecost. Thousands of people come to faith in Christ. And then there was a great persecution in Jerusalem, which scattered people out all across the known world at the time taking with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as it turns out, it was God's plan for them that they would be strangers in a foreign place, that they would go and be light in the midst of darkness, and they would represent Jesus wherever they found themselves. And so to these people, believers in Jesus Christ, who are scattered across this region, strangers, aliens, different, right, foreigners in this place, Peter is going to write to them specifically about something they were going to encounter, which was suffering. They were going to encounter difficulty 
faithful believers in Jesus. They'd already had to leave their homes. They find themselves in a foreign place, but they were about to encounter suffering. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says, Beloved, writing to them, right? Believers, faithful Christians, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. Don't be shocked at what you're going through, the suffering that's ultimately coming, which comes upon you through, for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share for the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. There is this very pervasive lie, and I mean, it is everywhere across our nation. You're going to hear it preached in pulpits and certainly claimed elsewhere that God's will for you. You'll know that you're killing it in Christianity if, if God is providing for you health, He's providing for you wealth and general prosperity. If that's what you got going on, it, it kind of goes like this. Um, what God would desire is for you to be complete, that if you're walking in Him, you have enough faith, you're believing the right things, you're walking in the right things, that what will naturally happen is you're going to walk in all of God's blessing. And what I want to say to you, church, is that is a lie from the pit of hell. That Christianity, from the very beginning, has been a call to suffering. Now, it's not a very good selling point, all right? I'd much rather pursue the thing that says you're going to get rich and you're always going to be healthy and you're never going to suffer if you'll just have enough faith and you'll be good. But that is a lie from the pit of hell that I believe the enemy has told to American Christians in particular to keep us from really ever setting foot on the battlefield. That what we're chasing after is monetary wealth. We're chasing after comfort. We're chasing after pleasure. And there are some pastors out there that would tell you that somehow that is the will of God for you. Again, I want to tell you that's a lie. These brand new Christians, and this is in the first, I don't know, 50 or 60 years after Jesus is gone, Peter's writing and saying, hey, don't, don't be shocked at what you're going through. Matter of fact, you need to persevere in the midst of this. He goes on throughout the book to encourage the believers. He says in 1 Peter 4.1, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same purpose. Jesus, who showed up here on earth finding everything broken and scarred by sin, people being devastated by the effects of sin in their life, Jesus came to be a bondservant to suffer and die that others might find life. And Peter says, arm yourself with the same purpose. That's your job too. Scattered out wherever you are, born in the family you were born into, the neighborhood you live in, the job that you're working, the friend group you walk in, arm yourself with the same purpose. So this morning, as we begin to talk about spiritual warfare, uh, the first thing that I want to encourage you to do as we engage in that is to step onto the battlefield. That it's really easy for us in American Christianity to kind of go through uh, our, you know, the steps. You know, you like to get up, you might do a little reading, a little praying when life gets difficult. You go to church on Sunday, Sunday if you're super legit. You go to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, which we don't have Sunday night church, so you can't be super legit and go here. But if you are in other places, like, you go through the steps, but you never actually begin to live out this life of obedience to Jesus Christ where you say, you know what, I'm going to step onto the battlefield. I'm going to allow God to begin to work through me. I want to be light in the midst of darkness. There's this thing, this odd thing that happened with American Christianity where we kind of flip the switch when it's time to go to church. We kind of flip the switch where we're like, hey, Jesus, I want enough of you that you'll enrich my life. Man, bless my money, my business, right? I, I need you to keep me healthy because I don't want to be sick and suffer and I don't want to leave my loved ones. And, and if you would, just kind of help things generally trend in the right direction. But we never actually followed after Jesus, which following Jesus may mean suffering for our lives. So how do we engage in spiritual warfare? Number one, we step onto the battlefield. If you don't believe in spiritual warfare, which this is kind of a common American response, by the way, like you're like, eh, I think that may happen in Africa. I've heard about that. People being demon possessed or maybe in Southeast Asia, some of that going on, you know, South America. I've heard about stuff, but I don't really see it here. I'm not sure I believe it exists. If, if that's you, can I just maybe put a little challenge on you today? A little, I want you to test it. If you don't believe spiritual warfare exists, I want you to commit yourself to leaving here and sharing the gospel with somebody. Just maybe write the name down. You might write yourself a little note. I, Jason Ware, I'm going to share the gospel with. And just put your name in the blank. And then go and seek to do that. And see if you don't face opposition from the enemy. 
See if you don't have a terrible time getting a hold of that person, like you can't seem to find a moment to talk, they get distracted, you don't have a, ch a chance to share, or you start to get anxious, you're getting sweaty, you're like, I don't know how to form words, suddenly the sentences don't work. If you don't believe there's spiritual warfare going on, then attempt to step onto the battlefield. Share the gospel with someone, and you will see that you have an enemy who is opposing you. That what he wants you to do is just to step back from it. Hey, don't, don't get in the battle. And if you'll just go home today and take it easy with your family, Sunday's the day of rest. You need a nap, right? And you're going to begin to have all these excuses for why you shouldn't share and how it's not the right time, and maybe they're going to get offended and you don't want to be poo pushy. And there will be 10,000 excuses flood your mind. And many of those from the enemy that would wish for you to step back and not to actually live out the Christian life, following after Jesus in obedience to him. Today, as we think about spiritual warfare, I want you to think about what it would look like for you to step onto the battlefield and begin to engage in this fight. To begin to engage on behalf of the souls of your friends and family, the people that you might work with, to engage in that battle. All right, so how are we going to do that? I'm, we're going to pick up here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, stepping onto the battlefield, here are a few things that I would want you to see. Um, first of all, we've got to do so from a posture of humility. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1, um, in kind of concluding the thoughts. And he's talked about elders and young men and how we live this out in our marriage, like how we should live out our faith. Peter's now going to say, he's kind of giving us the final therefore, and he says, therefore, you're going to do this, right? You're going to suffer just like Jesus did. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. So when you think about yourself and you're like, okay, I'm a believer. I've been called to follow Jesus Christ. If any man would come after me, take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. Okay, Jesus, I want to do that. I want to follow after you. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we do that? Because, man, I'm weak. I'm prone to sin. I literally don't have words sometimes, and I don't know all the Bible I need to know. Here, here's the thing. What we do is we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, knowing that God has used all sorts of men and women throughout history to advance the gospel, to advance the kingdom, to bring light into the midst of darkness. And if he can use them, then he can use us. That as much as we trust in kind of the weakness of our flesh, or we know how weak we are and how much we struggle, we would trust even more in the overwhelming power of God to be at work in us and through us. What we might choose to believe is that God has created us just as he created us, like knit you together in your mother's womb with your talents and abilities and aptitudes, maybe even those things that are kind of embarrassing about you, right? Like all the person that you are, and that he has intentionally placed you where he has placed you, in this place at this time, and he has done so that you might be a light to whatever group that you're walking in, that you might be a light here today. It's humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God. Like, okay, God, I trust you. And what that looks like is I'm going to take a little step here, and it's a step of faith. That if you don't do something, nothing's going to happen. So we humble ourselves. We adopt this posture of humility. Here's what you need to know. You will never face a spiritual battle or any sort of spiritual warfare that God has not allowed. You're not going to uh, undergo any temptation, face any trial or difficulty that God has not allowed into your life. Can I just say this? The battle that you are walking through, it is not a surprise to God. When we look back in, in Job... We see that Job was a man who was incredibly blessed. I mean, he had, uh, he had a big old ranch, right? I mean, Job had it going on. He had uh, all the cattle and all the sheep. I mean, he was very prosperous. He had home. He had a great big family. Like, life was really, really good for Job. And it was Satan who appears before God two different times, Job 1 and chapter 2. And Satan has to get permission from God to test Job. And he did. Job lost the cattle and the sheep, the land, the wealth. He lost his family, sons and daughters, and he lost his health. And there in the middle of Job, you're going to find a man who is suffering, having lost every external thing, even covered in sores. And yet he doesn't curse God. 
He humbles himself beneath the mighty hand of God. Did you know that sometimes in your suffering, a lot like Job, you're not going to see what God's doing? But when we humble ourselves before him, we trust that God is working whatever it is that we're going through for our good and for his glory. And that's not easy. To say that this suffering has been allowed. As a matter of fact, if you read here in the, the first Peter passage, he says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing. But sometimes God is allowing things into our life to teach us what it looks like to trust him, to teach us what it looks like to run to him. In this, this passage, he says, humble yourselves, mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Um, and then he, he tells us like what it should look like when we go through difficulty. He says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So when you're afraid and when you're hurting and you're anxious and you're fearful and you're struggling to walk through it what God has determined that we should do is run to him over and over and over God I'm not I'm not sure I can make it through this and we find in him that he is our strength God this feels like it's going to crush me and yet it is God who supports us if you read the Psalms and the Proverbs it's like the manual for spiritual warfare you have the mighty man David Slain as tens of thousands, a mighty king over the nation of Israel. But sometimes things would go bad. And he's writing in the Psalms like, God, where are you? And I thought you called me to be a king and lead your people. And it doesn't seem like you're working on our behalf. Where are you? And then by the end of the Psalm, he's like, oh, you were there in the midst of it. You were there in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the suffering. God, you are my strong tower. You're my fortress. You're my shelter. You're my help in my time of need. That's who you are. Some of our difficulties that we face is merely God allowing us to undergo suffering that we might strengthen, that he might strengthen us. We might learn how to turn toward him and walk in his power. And so we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We adopt this posture of humility. Please do not try to go out and fight a spiritual battle on your own. Please don't try to convert someone to Christianity on your own or like wage some spiritual battle on your own. If you want to get your tail kicked, try it on your own. But if you want God to work through you, you humble yourself and say, okay, God, I see that I'm here for a purpose and I'm not going to waste my time. Would you begin to work through me? And at the proper time, whenever that might be, and it might be today and it might be tomorrow, it might be next year, uh, God is going to exalt you. In high school, Freshman in high school, God did a pretty significant work in my heart, uh, and, and I didn't know what exactly was going on, but I knew that my friends needed to know Christ. And I had a couple of friends, let me just tell you, they were, they were those guys. You know the ones that you would like talk about in conversation, everyone's like, oh yeah, I know him, right? I could mention some of their names today, and you might know who they were. Uh, they were not living for the Lord, and I just began to pray. I mean, for days and days and then weeks and then months and then for years. I remember being in college thinking, God, are you ever going to do anything in their lives? And then it was like, I've been doing this for a decade. And then it was two decades. And I'm like, God, are you ever going to do something? And yet for my two kind of closest friends in high school that, that were absolutely lost and not following Jesus, I could call either one of them today. And we're going to have a conversation about the goodness of God, about how he works in their lives. And we don't know when that time is going to be, but as we labor for the gospel, as we step into that spiritual battle, it's not up to us, the timing. It's up to us to humble ourselves before God and say, God, would you just use me to be light in the midst of that darkness? And at the proper time, God's going to work and God's going to move and he's going to accomplish his purpose. Whether we know it or not, whether we recognize it or not, God is ultimately going to handle it. And so we cast our anxiety on him. In the meantime, God, it seems like it's never going to happen. God, I've been praying for my spouse for a decade. Still not happening. We cast our anxiety on him because he cares for us. He knows every concern before we even voice it to him. So, the church of Jesus Christ, people who are strangers in this place, People that recognize that this isn't our home, we're not citizens of this kingdom, we're citizens of God's kingdom, who have been placed where we've been placed. And I want to encourage you to set foot on the battlefield, to adopt a posture of humility, to not fight in your own strength. And then he continues in teaching us, Peter speaking in his kind of concluding thoughts here. In verse 8 of 1 Peter 5, he says, Be of sober spirit. 
be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. <clears throat> now, I don't know how you are with lions. Uh, I've watched a few of those YouTube videos where the guys are hunting lions in Africa, and there's something called like a death charge, where apparently uh, that's what the, kind of the last act of the lion's life. Uh, when you're hunting a lion, it's going to like charge at you. And there are these hunters who pay lots of money for someone to take them on one of these hunts so that they can uh, endure the death charge, right? And so at the last minute, they want to shoot the gun and drop the lion in his tracks, and it's really big and exciting thing that's going to happen. I don't ever want to do that, ever. I don't want to be a part of something that might, if I don't do the right thing in a split second, that I might end up dying. Now, Almighty God, in His sovereign wisdom, has chosen to tell us in His Word that your enemy is like that lion. And if I'm just hanging out with a lion, I'm intimidated. I'm a little bit afraid. I know of the power and the ferocity of a lion. And I think God chose to use these words on purpose for us that we wouldn't take it kind of lightly that we're in a battle. You should know that this is important and it's significant. But he says to us as we begin to be of sober spirit and to be on the alert. So we should be paying attention. Our enemy is significant. Uh, several years ago with my seminary, I needed a bunch of credit hours fast. And so I, I got to go to England, uh, travel there with my seminary to do some studying. And I got a bunch of credit hours in a short amount of time. And so while I was there, there's lots of things that could strike you about a different country. Uh, their food isn't nearly as good. They eat a bunch of lamb. They need, they need more beef in England, okay? They need to learn how to grill, some things. But regardless, the thing that struck me the most when I was in England was that everywhere we would go, which were fairly touristy areas, there would be police officers constantly telling us that we needed to mind your purse, ma'am, or, uh, sir, you need to mind your wallet. They would say, mind your stuff. Uh, because in England, there exists a culture of theft. There are pickpockets everywhere. And the thing about pickpockets is if you're not wary, if you're not paying attention, they will steal from you without you even knowing it. Welcome to spiritual warfare in America. That we get so caught up in what's going on. And let me just tell you, if you're in London, you're seeing all the sights, you're looking at all the, the beautiful cathedrals, you, you can get so caught up in what's going on that you don't even notice what's happening. Listen, in the most prosperous place in the history of the world, we could get so caught up in all the good things of our culture. Man, we're chasing after the things everybody else is chasing. Our kids running here, we're going there pursuing hobbies and pleasures and all the things that God's given us. If we're not careful, the enemy will steal from us without us even knowing it. We're just drifting with culture. We're just doing all the things our friends were doing. We're just kind of rolling through life, taking, what, what, taking whatever God gives to us or whatever happens to come our way. And if we're not careful, the enemy has been there the whole time, stealing and killing and destroying. And so the third point that I would want to point you to of spiritual warfare is to be alert, but not afraid. Be alert, but not afraid. To, like, to be conscious that there is an enemy, a roaring lion that wants to steal. He wants to do this in your marriage. And he's going to be very subtle about it. He wants to sow seeds of division or selfishness. All he cares about is destruction. He wants to do it in your family, in your kids. He wants to do it among your friends. To do it in your workplace. The enemy just wants to destroy. And so as the people of God, strangers in this place, called to be light in the darkness, and we've got to be willing to set foot on the battlefield, humbling ourselves before God. Being alert, but not afraid. Here's what we know. Jesus Christ has already won the victory, right? He has disarmed every ruler and authority. He's, he's got dominion over all things. Anything we're going to face today is only going to be faced by the permission of God. And so we need to be alert because we do know that tests and trials are coming. But we don't have to be afraid because God has got this. He's got it covered no matter what it is that we would ultimately go through. Now, being alert, what does that mean for us? For much of the church of America, it, it means being awakened to the realities that are all around us. We live in a culture, and if, if you just maybe pay attention as you drive down the street, maybe go down to some of the poorer places in our city, and you know what you're going to see? 
you're going to see addiction and the enemy wreaking havoc in the lives of the sons and the daughters of God who were created in God's image to know Him and to enjoy Him, but instead their lives are being destroyed by drugs or alcohol or whatever other thing is out there. If you, if you could see behind the, you know, our, our busyness, that we're on our way to take our kids to ball practice, we're, we're driving past homes where children are being abused and neglected, and they don't know that anyone out there loves them. Like the enemy is at work in our city, but we end up so busy running to and fro because our kids have to experience everything that there is because we've got to pursue our hobbies and make more money and do all the things we don't realize it, but we've kind of fallen asleep to the work of the enemy, that we're not seeing what's happening around us. When Jesus walked into Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, which was, I mean, it's an okay city, fairly populous, like lots going on. You know what he saw when he walked into the city? He saw people who were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, and his heart was broken. He was moved with compassion. Jesus ultimately went to the cross to lay down his life for those people. Do you know, like as Jesus invites us to follow him, he's like, hey, deny yourself and take up your cross too. That as we leave these doors today, we ought to look and we ought to see people where they are, and whether they're being consumed by addiction or abuse or whether it just be rampant consumerism. We ought to have the same heart of compassion that Jesus had. Our eyes are open to the work of the enemy in our culture. Some months ago, our, our ladies did a, a women's event here. It was a live stream it was of the IF gathering. And I, I didn't go. Sorry, I didn't feel comfortable being in the midst of the women's gathering, but I heard a lot of uproar about one talk in particular where they had interviewed a, a pastor from Iran. Uh, if you didn't know this, but in, in Iran right now, Christianity is exploding. And, and what's so crazy about that is that uh, it's really difficult to be a Christian in Iran. As a matter of fact, from converting from Islam to Christianity uh, is potentially punishable by death. Like There are people being jailed for possessing a Bible. So as they interviewed this pastor, he, he talked about um, how they'd made it from Iran to the United States. And listen, they get to live here. They got air conditioning. They got all the comforts, all the money that's available to us, the, the pleasures and the comforts of the United States. And as he tells a story of his wife coming to him one day and telling her husband, hey, we've got to go back. I want to, I want to quote to you what, what she said to him. She said that America is in the grip of a satanic lullaby. She said, they're sleepy. She said, I'm going sleepy here. There, talking about Iran, she said, we never knew every day we stepped out our, outside our home if we would live or die for our faith. We were always on the alert, always willing to die for our faith, and here we are being lullabied into apathy, a threat greater than persecution. Can you think about it? The wealthiest country in the history of the world where we are free to speak of Jesus Christ, to gather and to celebrate together. Maybe one of the primary tactics of our enemy isn't to persecute us. The church seems to thrive in the midst of persecution, but rather it's just to lull us to sleep. But rather than stepping onto the battlefield, beginning to engage in spiritual warfare, seeing the people of our city, of our community as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd who need the gospel of Jesus Christ, maybe the enemy would just hand us a, a little bit more comfort, a little bit more pleasure, a little bit more success, whatever that is, to, to just hand to us anything that it might take to lull us back to sleep, such as the, most, the church with the most resources, the most like financial freedom of any country in the history of the world. We just would never leverage that for the sake of the kingdom. Just go back to sleep. Come to church on Sunday. Raise your hand, some of the songs, but then leave here and go pursue some sort of Christianized version of the American dream. Could it be true for us that apathy is a greater threat than persecution? That we might just get all the comfort that we seek. 
Now, we might have that thing where we raise a couple of good kids and live in a nice house and have some nice cars and our 401ks grow appropriately and we get to plan the vacation and have the experiences, but our lives ultimately matter for nothing. Peter says, be of sober spirit. This just means kind of calm and collected. You should see the world as it is. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But he says this, but resist him. Don't let him lull you to sleep. Don't flee when the battle comes. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Hey, look around, church in America. There are people who are suffering for their faith. People being in prison for owning a Bible. Martyrs being made of people who dare speak of the gospel. May we see their boldness and be encouraged to do our part. That we're going to hold our end of the line. That we can be counted on to go to battle spiritually on behalf of our fellow citizens and on behalf of our community, on behalf of our family. That we wouldn't fall into the trap of apathy. But we would be about the work of God. He, he continues on here and he says, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Oh, God's going to win. Like in the end, we know that Jesus has, has got this. He's taken care of the enemy. He's been disarmed. But for a little while, God has allowed him the freedom to work in this world. And we have got to be the light to counteract that darkness. And we're a kingdom of priests who are to declare the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his light. Our community needs to know of the love of Jesus Christ. They need to know of the gospel of the cross, that Jesus died for their sin, that they might have new life, and they might have that eternally. Our suffering is just for a little while. The difficulties that we might endure, the awkwardness of the conversation, it's just for a little while. Anything we might give up financially, we won't even notice it a month from now. Our suffering is just for a little while. But the benefits of the gospel, of faith in Christ, are eternal. And even though we feel weak and unqualified, and like we don't you know, have any business entering into this battle, what we know is that a day very soon, Christ himself will perfect and confirm and strengthen and establish us. Because he has dominion over all. So before us, we have this opportunity to wage in spiritual warfare, to make our lives count for something, something that's eternal, to see that men and women will not spend their eternity in a place called hell, but might come to know Jesus Christ, and we might get to be a part of that, used by him. That we might see our community transformed and suffering in some ways lessened, at least suffering for the sake of suffering, but that we might begin to suffer for the sake of Christ and see the gospel go forth. So what does it look like for us very practically? Because, I don't know, it's kind of been a little bit out there in terms of what it looks like to fight. I want to give you three ways that we can begin to fight this battle spiritually. Specifically, ways that you can begin to fight this battle. Number one, you begin praying fervently for God to use you. Now, I know it might be easier to pray that God would use somebody else. But you would just begin to see yourself as the person that God has created for every good work that he has you to walk in. Like, like God didn't mess up. He didn't leave some stuff out. But he's created you with your gifts and talents and abilities as you are, placed you where you are in this time to walk in good works, to run the race that he's marked out for you. And you might just raise your hand and say, God, would you use me? God, on behalf of my, my stinking lost friends who are about as ornery as they could ever come, God, would you just use me? Even if it's just to be a faithful witness along the way, even if I don't get to be the one that gets to pray and be in their presence when they trust Jesus Christ, God, would you use me along the way? God, in this life that can be difficult and busy and there will be suffering and difficulty, God, would you make my life count? I'm here. Would you use me however you see fit? 
that when it comes time to go to battle, I'm going to armor up and I'm going to step onto the battlefield and I'm just going to trust that you can do something through me that I can never do on my own. And that you'd get up every morning and like, this is deny yourself, take up your cross and begin to follow after Jesus Christ. Pray fervently, God, would you use me today? Before that, God, I'm going to need today, this is my daily bread. Would you empower me? Would you equip me? Man, I want to I want to I want to love the people that need to be loved. I want to help the people that need to be helped. And I want to speak the gospel to people that need to hear the gospel. Begin praying fervently. God, use me. Because you may be the only person in your friend's life or the life of your family, in your coworker's life, you may be the only person that's able to show them the light of Jesus Christ. You may be the one he's chosen. Just say, God, I'm here. Make yourself available to him. Number two, say, invest where you've been blessed. It sounds kind of silly, but here's what I mean. So where God has given to you, whether it be gifts of leadership, and you're a great encourager, and you're a prayer warrior, whether it be gifts of time, like you happen to find yourself in a, a place in life where you've got time to invest, that you would just say, God, I want to invest that in your kingdom. So what I'm not going to do is sit comfortably on the couch watching Netflix on my big 70-inch television and, and wonder what my purpose is. God, I'm just going to say, you've given me this time, so I'm going to invest it in your kingdom. God, I, you know, I happen to live in America, the most prosperous nation in the history of the world, and I, I have some free cash. I might convince myself that I don't, but I'm wealthier than the whole rest of the world. I want to leverage that stuff. I'm going to leave the cash on the sidelines, hoping one day for retirement that I can go to Aruba and live forever, whatever. It's like, God, I want you to use what you've been giving me to build the kingdom. I'm just going to invest where God has blessed you. You might have particular speaking gifts or teaching gifts. If you can begin to see your classroom, not as somewhere where you just convey information, but where you have the chance to witness on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to love kids that may otherwise not be loved. And in your workplace, whatever that looks like, you carry the light of the gospel there with you. Just investing where God has blessed you, where you've been given gifts and talents and abilities and time, and certainly our treasure. Yesterday, or yeah, yesterday, a group of our people from our church just went to Second Chances. It's a recovery ministry in our city that, let me just tell you, they, they see broken people coming through the doors every single day. They help them you know, like get free from addictions. They, they teach them about who Jesus is. They help them get jobs. They provide people with clothes and foods. They help them in all sorts of ways. And you know one of the things they depend upon? That people of God would do something other than their hobbies. And come in and help. And come in and serve. And come in and meet with some people. Be a mentor to a person. It's volunteers. And all across our community, there are nonprofits that are in need of people to say, yeah, I've been blessed, so I'm ready to invest that in the kingdom of God. So we begin praying firmly, God, would you use me? And then we ask, God, what have you given me that I can begin to invest in the kingdom? And the final thing that we do is we commit to sharing the gospel to speaking the words that Jesus Christ saw me in my sin. I was raised in church. I had the cleavers for parents. I mean, I had every opportunity to do it all right. I, I, I was in Sunday school. I won Bible drill competitions, but at the end of the day, my heart was desperately sick. And Jesus Christ, in his grace, he came and he found me. Jesus Christ saw all of my sin. I mean, the guy who had every chance to get it right but still got it wrong, Jesus found me in that sin, and he died on the cross that I might have a new life in him, that I could be declared righteous, not because of me, because I blew that, but because of him. And he rose on the third day, and he sent his Holy Spirit to live within me, that I might have new life. We declare the words of the gospel to the people around us. You know, there was this interaction Jesus had, it's often known as the rich young ruler, where the man comes to Jesus and he says, hey, what, what must I do to be saved? And they go through a discussion of, of what it means, love the Lord your God, basically a discussion of the law. So what you had to know and believe in order to be saved. And Jesus, seeing that that man had something that was preventing him from truly following after Jesus, 
that maybe the guy was trusting in what he knew uh, rather than uh, having genuine faith in his heart. And so Jesus says to this man, um, okay, you, you believe all the right things. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbors yourself. you got all that down. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go sell all that you have. And I want you to give it to the poor. And then I want you to come and follow me. You know what the scriptures say about him? He went away sad. Christianity is not about adopting a set of beliefs. It's not about knowing the right things or having the right perspectives. Christianity is ultimately about expressing our faith in Jesus Christ by following after Him. Can I ask you the question today? What is that thing that if Jesus asked you to give that up, you'd be like, well, well, I'm not sure. Hey, Jesus, I'll, I'll come to church and I'll give a little and I'll serve a little, but don't, don't ask me to give this thing up. It may be true that that's the very thing keeping you from living out the purpose for which you were created. That's the thing that's keeping you from really following after Jesus and being light in the midst of darkness. And so today, we're going to have a time of response and so what I want you to do is just to begin to pray through that. What's keeping you from living for Jesus? From living the life of a disciple where you're sold out to him that you understand that my sole purpose for being in this place, a stranger in this land, is that I might carry the light of the gospel to people that really, really need it. Would you bow with me? Jesus, you're our hope. We praise you because you've saved us. You've called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. I pray that we would be a people that declare your excellencies, that just talk about how good you are, about your overwhelming love that we can't even fully explain. God, that your love would be poured through our hearts into the lives of everyone that we come into contact with. Father, help us to wake up, to be alert, to not be asleep throughout this life, that we might live our lives on mission for you. Jesus, we need you. God, I pray that in the next few minutes you begin to reveal those things in our lives, those areas where we say, God, you can have all of this, but you can't have that. God, would you give us the grace to surrender fully, to just respond in obedience to you. For the person who's here that's never trusted in you, that's never come to know you as their Savior, never come to faith and to recognize all of what you've done for them, to recognize your goodness, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.